Hi everyone, Clara is here again. Welcome to Difference Frames the World, a demonetized channel to say the world differently. Today we continue to talk about the anti-Japanese war, translated from Mark's talk in Mandarin on his Chinese channel. Viewers who know or want to learn Chinese, can watch his original video by following the link in the description and pinned comments. As his video is very long, over 40 minutes, we divide it into several parts. We published the first episode early today, and here comes part two. Before starting the second episode, we must thank our supporters and patrons for their continuous support to keep DFTW alive for nearly nine months after Google demonetized all our English channels. If you want to support us, please click the links in the description and pinned comments or scan the QR codes on the bottom left of the video. Your generosity and help are essential to keep DFTW alive as an independent alternative voice to the mainstream media. Now we talk about the date of Japan's formal surrender to China. There are several dates related to Japan's surrender, and here we discuss a few versions. The first date was August 15, 1945 when the Japanese emperor issued an imperial edict to immediately end the war and surrender to the Allied forces. Many people think that was the day of surrender, it is not true because although the emperor issued an imperial edict of unconditional surrender, the Japanese army in China did not immediately lay down their arms. Some Japanese troops continued to fight with the Chinese army, as orders from headquarters changed repeatedly and contradicted each other. So August 15, 1945, was issuing date of the emperor's unconditional surrender statement, not the end of the war against Japan in China. The second date was August 21, 1945, when Takeo Amei, the Japanese general we mentioned in the first episode, went to Hunan to make arrangements for surrender venues and to whom the Japanese soldiers should surrender. The Kuomintang government representatives talked with Takeo Amei to discuss the surrender ceremony only and did not accept Japan's official surrender that day. Some people consider it the Japanese Surrender Day, which is also incorrect. The third date was September 2, 1945, when Japan surrendered to the Allies, so September 3 was called Victory Day, and China also treated it as the Victory Day of the war against Japan. It is no problem because China is a part of the Allies, so we can treat September 2 as the day of Japan's surrender or the day of the Japanese surrender to China. So we can consider September 2nd as the day of Japan's surrender or China's victory day. Still, the actual date of Japan's surrender to China was September 9, 1945, when Chinese General He Yingchen accepted the official submission of the surrender from Yasuji Okamura. It was the day the Japanese surrendered, so China's war against Japan was from September 18, 1931, to September 9, 1945. During those 14 years, tens of millions of people were killed and wounded, displaced, lost their families and relatives, and tens of thousands of Chinese mothers and daughters were abused. Countless Chinese and Korean women were turned into comfort women to satisfy the bestiality of the Japanese army. Despite the harm done to China, Korea and other Asian nations, the Japanese government has not openly, sincerely apologized for their atrocities on those countries. Mr. Kazuo Inamori, who died recently, said that Japan should apologize to China. He was a great person, and his greatness was not merely because of establishing two Fortune 500 companies and bringing the wisdom of the East to the same level as the Western management experts like Peter Detrick. He was such a great character, mainly because he had a noble mind beyond sheer popularism, which is remarkable. When we mention the country of Japan, we need to know there are many great Japanese, like those who are and were anti-war. Many Japanese are anti-war, including the recently assassinated foreign Japanese prime minister's grandfather, who was also an anti-war fighter. China and Japan should be forward-looking instead of treating each other as enemies because of some politicians' selfish desires and the militants' ambitions so the two countries can avoid the previous tragedy from happening again. On August 15, 1945, the Japanese emperor issued a decree of unconditional surrender. The photo on the screen shows how happy the people of Chongqing were. Chongqing was China's capital during the anti-Japanese war. However, the Chinese called Chongqing the second capital, as they still regarded Nanking as the capital of China, although the Japanese occupied Nanking, and a traitor, Wang Jingwei, established a Chinese puppet government there. 300,000 Chinese were slaughtered, 
So Nanjing was an abattoir after the Japanese soldiers started killing civilians and captives. After the fall of Nanjing, the Kuomintang party moved the central government to Chongqing, the wartime capital or the accompanying capital. When the Emperor of Japan released the imperial edict to order Japanese generals and soldiers to lay down their weapons and surrender to the Allied forces, these photos on the screen showed the Japanese people listening to the Emperor. After the announcement of unconditional surrender from the expression of the Japanese people, we can see they were painful instead of being relieved from the war's ending. Japanese people were brainwashed entirely. Many Japanese generals felt they did not win the war against China, which led their emperor to issue this unconditional surrender imperial edict. They felt ashamed, and it is said that around 3,000 Japanese generals committed suicide by harakiri, a Japanese ritual of cutting their stomachs apart. In the future, when viewers go to the Japanese imperial palace, the guide will inform them that in the square outside the Japanese imperial palace, there were many Japanese generals committing harakiri at that time. So the Japanese nation is formidable, and one should never underestimate the nation. The cohesion of the Japanese nation is solid, and they have a kind of crazy worship of the Japanese emperor, whose divine right has been well maintained and glorified for more than 2,000 years. All the Japanese emperors share the same surname, which is rare worldwide, and the Japanese bureaucratic clans all have a connection with the royal family, so the Japanese imperial family and the country's bureaucracy, in essence, share the same ancestor. Ordinary people unconditionally obey their emperor and government, which is why China and Korea are always sensitive to Japan's attitude toward its past sins and atrocities. It is worth warning that once this country embarks on the road of militarism, it will give disasters and uncertainties to the world because of its superior technology. It has its nuclear power station, built by General Electric from the United States, and warships that can become helicopter aircraft carriers after slight modifications. Many years ago, Japan's industry set up standards tailored to military needs. Japanese enterprises like Mitsubishi can convert their workshops into military plants overnight. China has been Japan's target for hundreds of years, and the Japanese militants will not give up their goal if China cannot remain robust. Here on the screen are some Chinese newspapers reporting Japan's unconditional surrender. In the middle was the Takong Pao, a Chinese newspaper based in Hong Kong, established 120 years ago in 1902. And here is the Xinhua Daily, with Chairman Mao's handwriting, to celebrate the victory of the anti-Japanese war and the liberation of the Chinese nation. We mentioned earlier this Japanese general, Takeo Imei, who was quite a famous person in the history of the war against Japan. After the July 7 incident in 1937, he successfully persuaded Wang Jingwei to set up a pseudo-regime in Nanking, today's Nanjing. After the war ended, he wrote many books about the invasion of China, and in his books, the word China is everywhere. This word is not a historical or outdated term, and some still use it against China, as it is derogatory for China and the Chinese nation. As we said earlier, on August 21, 1945, this Japanese General Takeo Imei negotiated with the Kuomintang government's representative about arrangements to accept Japanese troop surrender. It is worth mentioning that Takeo Imei did not submit the surrender documents to the Chinese central government that day, so August 21, 1945, was not the day of Japan's surrender to the Chinese army. In the next episode, part 3 of the series, we will discuss why two war criminals, Yasuji Okamura and Kishi Nobusuk, were pardoned by the Chinese government and the Allied forces. Before ending the video, we must thank our supporters again for keeping DFTW alive. We extend our great thanks to all of them and all other viewers who have stayed with us in the past two years.